Welcome to the Talking With Tech Podcast. My name is Chris Bougay, and I'm here with Rachel Needle. Rachel. Yes. This is a big episode. It's such a big episode. I'm so excited. I've been really counting down the days until this episode airs. So let's give people a little backstory uh, around how this interview came to be. So for the last, mm, I don't know, year and a half, two years or so, uh, a topic that is has everyone buzzing in the world of speech language pathology, in the world of learning language with AAC, and certainly it's been a topic on our podcast where we've talked to a bunch of different people with different perspectives um, and have reflected on it, just you and I, talking in banter segments. Certainly topic that has come up at conferences where we've recapped what we've sort of experienced at different conferences, and that is the topic of... Gestalt language processing. Yes. It certainly seems to be controversial, and it certainly seems to be um, something that a lot of people have big feelings uh, around. Um, And uh, as we sort of navigate our way through to find out sort of what is a way to approach Gestalt language processing, one of the ideas that came up with uh, you and I sort of uh, thinking about what direction do we take this in the podcast, you had this great idea. Yeah. So, you know, kind of to reiterate what you were just saying, Chris, it's been on my mind in my clinical practice. I have been really eager to learn as much as I can about Gestalt language processing. If you're a listener of the podcast, you know, we've had Marge Blanc on the podcast, Alexandria Zachos. We've covered this episode with uh, Alyssa Hillary Zisk and Lily Conine. Lots of different kind of angles. And I think part of the reason it's controversial, it's it's because we don't know how to fuse what we know about AAC with what we're learning about Gestalt language processing. And I think that's like a really important distinction because I think all of the work around Gestalt language processing and building education and awareness around it has been really powerful and really useful. But we're myself, we're trying to like figure out like how do we fit all the pieces together with what we know about AAC. And so I decided I'm going to just go straight to the source. So I sent Barry Prezant, who is the interview today. Uh, I sent him an email. We are big fans of Barry's work. Uh, He has a book called Uniquely Human. And I remember reading that book and being really moved by that. Um, And he also has an amazing podcast where he's interviewed lots of autistic adults. Um, And in fact, his co-host on the podcast is autistic. Um, So I decided I'm going to reach out to Barry and just one, tell him I love his work Two, ask him about Gestalt language processing and reference some of his research. And three, like, why not just invite him on the podcast, you know, from one podcast host to another? Let's see if we'll go for this. Um, And I was just fangirling when I got a response from him. Um, I literally shrieked and (laughs) was so excited to see his name in my inbox. And he was so wonderful. Um, And he agreed to come on the podcast. And so I just was so excited to have a conversation with him. Um, You know, if you guys are in the field of speech language pathology, you have likely heard his name. You have likely read a textbook in graduate school that referenced him. Um, And so he's such an amazing, uh, he's done such amazing work for our field. And I couldn't be more excited to have had the chance to have a conversation with him. And then, of course, to have it recorded and to share it with you guys. He was very generous with his time, and we uh, talked to him for quite a bit. So because this is such a long interview, we decided to split it up into two parts. So here's part one of our interview with Barry Prezant. Hello, Talking with Tech listeners. I am India Oaks. And we are inviting you to join dynamic conversations with a community of people who are working together to make the world accessible for everyone at all times. And I'm Mailing Chan, and we're so excited to share the Exceptional Alliance's epic accessibility event to talk about all of the ways we can optimize how the world is experienced. That's right, Mailing. Accessibility isn't just about entry and curbs. It's about vocabulary, policy, innovation, research, how we access the world electronically, and so much more. Join Exceptional Alliances on October 20th and interact with intimate roundtable discussions about advancements in accessibility and live experiences. 
Registration's free, and it's important to remember that just by registering, you are actively supporting virtual event access, which demonstrates the value and continued interest in virtual events and supports accessibility. So grab your free spot at exceptionalalliances.com, and we look forward to chatting with you during the event. Welcome to Talking With Tech. I'm your host, Rachel Maynard, joined as always by Chris Bougay. Hey, Chris. Hi, Rachel. And we are so excited to have Dr. Barry Prezant on with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Rachel, it really, really is a pleasure. I'm looking forward to uh, our conversation. Uh, I I feel like you don't need an introduction, but just for our listeners who maybe are fresh to the field of speech language pathology, can you just start off by briefly introducing yourself? Um, Yeah, I am a speech language pathologist and I've been a speech language pathologist um, for, I can't even say it anymore, 50 years. Uh, (laughs) And uh, I always like to say to people that I started out uh, working in summer camps with kids um, residential summer camps before I, I pursued my degree in speech and language pathology and communication disorders. Um, and that was a great start to be on the ground with people with various labeled disabilities, misdiagnoses, where um, I lived with children and adults and was responsible for their happiness, their safety, um, and for five or six years, for two months every summer. Wow. Yeah. I I feel like that experience has really probably shaped your everything you've done because you have such an insight into kind of the day to day and every element of the day. I feel like summer camp is so immersive and it's just like morning, noon, night, like all the different kind of activities, routines, everything. Monumental influence. Uh, I always like to say that it certainly is nothing like living with a person you need to support in some cases Mm -hmm. 24-7 or love 24-7. But it's a little bit of that feeling of, um, okay, what do we do to make sure we're all safe when we go on a trip into town or we go to the, this was, I'm thinking of Southern New Jersey. Now we went to the rodeo downtown or um, yeah, uh, it it was uh, just an incredible experience that I think about all the time. And then how has your career blossomed from there? Again, with people who might not know about you, what's yeah. happened in those 50 years? Well, in those 50 years, um, first of all, when it comes to autism and even the broader category of neurodivergence, um, I started focusing on that in my master's program um, and actually did my master's thesis um, on writing a manual for parents. We're talking about 1975. Um, did my doctoral dissertation Um We've published in many different versions on echolalia. Uh, And then one of the experiences that was very formative, after my first few green PhD years at Southern Illinois University, um, where I I taught primarily at a master's and doctoral level then, I was recruited um, by uh, the Brown Department of Psychiatry, Brown University Department of Psychiatry in the medical school to develop um, a department in a children's psychiatric setting. Um, And it was actually the first communication disorders department, a dedicated department in communication disorders in a children's psychiatric setting in the world at the time. Um, And so I was working with mental health and child psychiatry, mental health professionals and child psychiatrists um, very early on in my career. I was in my 30s at that point and was exposed to an incredible array of learning opportunities. Um, truly working with some of the leading psychiatrists in the world, Daniel Stern, Arnold Samaroff, who's actually a psychologist, and was exposed to the transactional model of child development. I'm a child development person, that a huge part of my training was in social, language, cognitive, emotional development in children at the time that there was an explosion of research in that area in the 70s and 80s. And that was incredibly formative um, because I always feel we always have to look through the lens of child and human development. Well, okay, you mentioned the word echolalia, and that um, is one of the reasons we're reaching out to you. So, Rachel, unless you think we should do this differently, I'm just going to tell Dr. Brazant the story here. Um, So 
in Rachel's and mine work and with the podcast and presentations we get to do and conversations we have with colleagues, um, we've come to to understand uh, that there's a term out there called Gestalt language processing. Yes. And in our uh, sphere of conversations, it seems like people land in one of two camps around Gestalt language processing. So before I go any further, could you take a second and just maybe describe in your words how you think of Gestalt language processing? And then I'll describe how we see these maybe two camps uh, forming. Sure. And I'll have to give you kind of the quick and dirty story here. Uh, in uh, my research uh, in developing the rationale for studying echolalia, um, I began to look into work that had been done in linguistics and psycholinguistics. I actually was an undergraduate psycholinguistics major before I went into speech pathology. And I found um, little known references to children who were learning language using an alternative strategy of language learning. Because um, we spoke and we, I mean, we, we all learned, not that we spoke, but we all learned about analytic language processors, that children build language from its basic constituent elements of words, early multi-word utterances, for those SLPs out there, early semantic relationships. <laughs> and language was always thought of as creative. Um, and why is it creative? Because what we're really learning is generative rules that are part of our cognitive knowledge of language. But rather than kids just going from single word to early two word utterances to three word utterances to more complex grammar in their development, there was this minority position of some kids, certainly a minority group of kids who were using, if you will, memory strategies to learn larger chunks of language. And the term Gestalt language processing actually came from a linguist uh, named Ann Peters. And she published a book in the 70s called The Units of Language Acquisition. Actually, she published some articles and then the book came after the articles where she said, and she knew nothing about, and she, and she didn't cite any work about children with language disabilities, autism, whatever, okay? Um, and she said, well, wait a second, some typically developing kids start out by memorizing chunks of language that sometimes they could be three, four word utterances that they hear on a regular basis. And these are the kids, and this is actually my opinion, who some parents say, well, it's like, it's like he went from single words to long sentences um, and made that huge leap in development. Okay, so let's get back to echolalia. Um, I had worked with young kids as a speech language pathologist who were very echolalic. I followed those kids for a year and that became the data for my doctoral dissertation. I uh, Early days of video analysis, I videotaped these kids at home and at school in different settings. Um, and I was being exposed to the literature, behavioral literature, especially LOVAS um, from your neck of the woods, Southern California at UCLA, mm -hmm. who was saying echolalia is meaningless parroting and it should be extinguished and we need to get rid of it, okay? Now, from the very beginning, I knew that Lovas knew nothing about language development. And many behavioral psychologists knew nothing about language development, <laughs> because how do you teach language? And this literally came out of the most prominent language programs um, that were developed by behavioral psychologists. First, you teach kids to say sounds. Buh, buh. Then you teach them to add more consonants into their sounds. Buh, buh. And then you teach them to say, pop the balloon, that you literally build language from sounds into words, into sentences, which has nothing to do with the process of language development that hundreds of researchers were studying who would develop mental psychologists, psychiatrists, and so forth. Okay, let's get back to the point here. Um, so Gestalt language processing was a literature that said, no, wait a second, maybe this is what we're seeing in children, especially children on the autism spectrum, because even back then, psychological research, and that's what it was called, into the language of autistic kids and cognitive processing, pointed out 
that they had not only intact, but in some cases, exceptional rote memories. So let's tie this together, okay? Mm -hmm. That if you approach language from the perspective of, I really got a good memory, but I don't have the cognitive ability to construct an internal generative language system, that I'm going to learn how to speak by listening to people and memorizing what they're saying. Mm. And that was an exact description of what I was observing in the immediate echolalia and the delayed echolalia of the children I was working with every day. But then I went back to the parents and I said to them, your kids repeat speech a lot. Sometimes it's something they've, they've heard in the past. Sometimes it's something they repeat immediately. Want to go out? Want to go out? And I said to them, why do you think they do that? And I, I didn't do, no leading questions. I didn't say, well, some people feel it's meaningless or so forth. Mm. And I got all these descriptions of how it was communicative. Mm. Okay, And I said, I got a dissertation topic here. <laughs> so Gestalt language processing was what I took from Ann Peter's work, the description. But it mapped so beautifully onto all the research on not only intact, but in some cases, exceptional rote memory in individuals with autism. Mm -hmm. um, and it all of a sudden made sense. This is their cognitive style. Um, and the it, it doesn't, and by the way, it goes well beyond speech, that very often we see individuals on the spectrum having incredible visual memory, not all, but many. And this is a term for that, eidetic imagery, photographic memory. Mm -hmm. Where And I, I remember this so clearly, a child I work with, and this was a 12-year-old, his school had gone to visit a museum. And it was, I think it was in New York City, um, probably the Museum of Natural History, a room with full of dinosaurs, mm -hmm. and, and an old room, a huge room. Um, and he told me, I went to a museum today. And I said, could you make a picture? Because I knew he loved to draw. Not only did he make a picture of dinosaurs in... Or, or replicated pictures of dinosaurs, but he replicated cracks in the ceiling. He replicated the exit signs. It was like he took a photograph of it in his mind, purely wrote and was able to give all of the detail. So let's go back to echolalia. There are some echolalia kids who faithfully reproduce foreign accents. Mm -hmm. There's actually research on some kids before they move to echolalic speech they echo sounds in the environment. There's some literature, but not much, about kids on the spectrum who've learned sign language and they are, they're echolalic in sign language. There's a literature on kids who repeat people's actions, and the term for that is echopraxia. Mm. So it seems that even beyond speech, that rote memory ability is related to this gestalt language processing, but it goes beyond just speech and language. So that has been applied by other people, Marge Blank in particular, um, you know, and, and in terms of laying out a philosophy of what Marge calls natural language acquisition, natural for autistic individuals, okay? But that it should be recognized as their alternative strategy. Now, I will say this, since you guys are experts in AAC, I do know that it has also been applied to AAC, but I tell you the truth, I, I'm, I'm generally aware of the controversies around that, in that most AAC approaches follow an analytic language development kind of strategy, but I'm not into the weeds of some of the more controversial discussions. So I've spoken a lot now, and I'll hand it back to you guys. <laughs> well, that was an excellent description. Let me see if I can describe these two camps and then yes. maybe just get your reaction on the these these two camps. So one would say one camp would say someone is born as a gestalt language processor um or they're born as an analytic processor and maybe there's some portion of the population that's a little bit of both, yes. but they are two separate uh, biological paths <laughs> that is something that you're born with. Now, someone else, the other camp might say, no, 
everybody's a bit of both. Uh, some people, um, actually, maybe most people produce echolalia in different ways, um, where you might uh, say something and repeat it back, or you might hear something from a movie and you'd use that as a script in your family in some in some cases, um, where not everybody in the world knows what you mean, but certainly it's shared amongst this small group of people. Um, so that uh, it is a it's part of being human is to, uh, there is no separate camp. And the reason I feel like it's important to try and distinguish whether one it's one or the other is because clinicians and educators are trying to find the best clinical practice. So if it's, well, if someone is a gestalt language processor and they're born that way, then maybe I need to use an entirely different approach than someone who's an analytical processor. Or... If it's a little, if everyone's a little bit of both, and maybe somebody's just more one way or more the other, then I could still use different clinical um, approaches. Uh, an approach that is a little bit more analytical might still work. It just might not be as effective, uh, or I could use it in conjunction with. It's not a closed door. So with that, what do you? What's your take? I mean, I, I really see it as a continuum. You've kind of laid that out. I mean. I guess it's a matter of gathering enough information to see kind of the the child's learning bias. Is it more of a, a gestalt learning bias? Is it more of an analytic learning bias? Um, and in my research, and I think this is you know much more classically observant um, in in kids on the spectrum and, and autistic people, um, where, where you know sometimes you see autistic kids who are primarily, you know, Gestalt language learners. And it takes a while for them to begin to move into generating novel multi-word utterances, okay? Um, I don't have strong opinions, I guess, because we don't have good research on this. And even, we don't have even good research on getting, you know, good reliability on determining where on the continuum is this person mm -hmm. of Gestalt, versus analytic. Um, I know, um, and, and again, I don't want to misquote because I'm not as deep into this as I should be, but I know that Alexandria Zakos, Alex Zakos, you know, that she really, both in AAC and in speech development, you know, is, is more biased towards let's be Gestalt with Gestalt learners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in other words, let's make sure that we are modeling whether it's through AAC or whether it's through speech, let's make sure we're modeling kind of more gestalt chunks that are functional for the child in life. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, early on, we, we published a number of articles and chapters on echolalia way, going way back, you know, to the 80s and to the early 90s. And, and we used to talk about helping gestalt kids break down the language to be more analytic. Mm -hmm. um, now, a, a certain, and this doesn't enter the conversation enough, but a certain subgroup, and it's a small subgroup, of um, individuals who are echolalic are, are also hyperlexic. Um, and hyperlexia is defined as a self-taught precocious reading ability, actually decoding ability, um, that, and is not good research that I'm aware of in longitudinal uh, even in the reading literature, in, in terms of in longitudinal views and following kids who were very hyperlexic, I'm talking like two-year-olds who could read in sentences, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a very extreme end of hyperlexia, not understanding much, but just from anecdotal experience for kids who I've known with hyperlexic, it's almost like they're moving from rote reading with very little understanding if we model the written language naturally mm -hmm. and as part of everyday activities, they become more analytic in the sense of they're breaking down the units of meaning, that it's no longer just a chunk mm. that they're using. So, I, I, you know, when you ask me where do I stand on those two positions, um, it's a great question that I haven't really thought about. Uh and that might be the reason you got me on the podcast. You want me to state what my opinion is on that? <laughs> well, to, to, that's exactly what we said. Why don't we just ask Dr. Prasan? Let's see. Rachel was the one who was like, I'm just going to write him and see what he says. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I think good 
language modeling in the context of everyday activities and even shifting back and forth between kind of modeling analytic language in, in a way that we're helping the child understand the rules of recombining words into longer grammatical utterances, as well as gestalt functional phrases. Um, it, it really comes down to looking at the child's reaction to our modeling and what they're picking up on. And that's, you know, when, when I said I was exposed to great people when I was in the, in the Department of Psychiatry at Brown, one of my mentors was Arnold Samaroff, who developed, and, and he doesn't, no work in disabilities, all in typical child human development, the transactional model of child development. And the basis of the transactional model, which has had a great influence on our field, is that we need to be highly responsive to the way a child or a person is reacting to how we're communicating with them. We have to be, of course, this is a big part of our CERTS model. We have to be highly responsive to signals of regulation or dysregulation. Um, and that makes us very different than most behavioral models, where we walk in with a program that we've developed and we have to adhere faithfully to that program and we don't adjust flexibly to what the child is telling us through their speech or through their behavior. Now, I know some behaviors are going to say, well, we don't do that anymore. But, uh, you know, the point is that I think this pertains to our discussion here. I, I think un until, and I don't know if we're going to ever have research that tells us if a child's language sample is 75% looking gestalt, then we need to do this. Because so much, let, let me give you a concrete example. It's very typical for kids who had been echolalic for years and now are using very creative, spontaneous language to actually go back to echolalic strategies in new situations, unfamiliar contexts, the beginning of a school, a new school year, being spoken to and asked questions by an unfamiliar person. Um, in other words, even echolalia is not a, and moving through to more analytic language is not fixed where once you read a certain, reach a certain point, you're there and that you're only there. Mm -hmm. um, that it could really, the degree of stress, because using Gestalt language and scripts actually allows us to have less of a cognitive load in mm -hmm. formulating language. Okay. If we could just come up with a memorized script, we do this all the time. You know, so when you're saying, well, yeah, we all use some scripts and some Gestalt language. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? You know, it's like <laughs> exactly. Great. How are you? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> we do that. Even if we're ordering a pizza, you know, I'm I, my favorite example for myself. Um, and I believe you have Dunkin' Donuts out in California. If you're going for, <laughs> you know, a coffee, uh, you know, I might say, you know, uh, medium hazelnut, extra, extra light, no sugar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a fused chunk, and I don't have to go back and think, okay, how do I formulate all the pieces of what I want my coffee to be like, mm -hmm. okay? So it's less of a cognitive load, and I don't think that's understood enough, mm -hmm. that we we all script. Um, my, my Another favorite example, you go to a social event, you really don't want to be there, you're tired, but you go there because your partner, you know, you feel obligated to go with your partner. Mm -hmm. And then you you see somebody you never really liked, and that person approaches you. And that person says, hey, Barry, how you doing? Oh, fine. How you doing, George? Hey, Barry, I, I hear that you, uh, you moved to a new neighborhood pretty close to where I live. Yep, new neighborhood. I think it's close to where you live. And, and you can carry on a conversation by repeating almost everything or part of what people say. You change the pronouns around a little bit. You could add no new information. And you could keep a, a conversation going because you just don't want to focus on talking to this person and putting the energy into it. Those are called, by the way, in the speech communication literature, those are called repetition strategies. Mm. Right. We would say in the AAC world, repetition with variety. So we want to repeat, but just change the words a little bit so you understand how those words can be used in different ways in different contexts. Exactly. And and the term for that in the echolalia literature is mitigated echolalia. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and mitigated, you know, it always kind of confused me because I always thought of mitigated as, um, you know, you you make something less, okay? Mm -hmm. But the term mitigated echolalia, and I think it, I first read it by a wonderful speech language pathologist, Warren Fay, who published early in the in the echolalia literature. He was um, a professor at uh, University of Oregon Health Sciences Center. He passed away a number of years ago. Um, and I'm one quote that I, I cite a lot, Warren said at that time, if we're not sure whether echolalia um, is functional and is helpful or not helpful and interfering for autistic kids, shouldn't we give them the benefit of the doubt? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. It, what's... It, What's the least dangerous assumption? It's more dangerous to assume that it has no meaning. So you have the least dangerous assumption of assume it does and be respectful of it. That seems something that uh, both camps uh, agree upon. We start there as a as a way to uh, bring everybody together. It's like let's yep. not abate it anymore. Let's respect it. Yes, I mean, yeah. I was, go ahead. I was going to ask an well, kind of give context to. The AAC, why basically why this is important. Yes. All right, I'll hop in. Um, so I think one of the reasons this question becomes so important with AAC is that when we're working with complex communicators um, who are either using augmentative forms of communication or alternative, um, it's hard from a motor planning perspective to follow, you know, a model where we're using long phrases in an AAC system and then we're trying to mitigate those phrases. And so I think, you know, for myself clinically, I have been supporting my students and very aware of what approaches they're responding to mm -hmm. and really using that information clinically to decide what I'm doing and, and how I'm moving forward. But mm -hmm. I think the AAC community is feeling very uh, challenged by the, the idea of how do we, I mean, AAC systems are set up analytically, right? It's set up with words yeah. that we learn the motor plans for. And so it just becomes a challenge when we're trying to support our, our communicators the best way possible in, you know, therapy and in, you know, all the work that we're doing. And so I think that it, it made me feel better that you said like, do a little bit of both and see, you know, how a child responds, because I feel like that's what I've been doing clinically. And I've been seeing a lot of success with that type of strategy. Yes. And as a matter of fact, I, um, uh, he was never really a colleague, but a, a distant colleague of mine, Howard Shane, um, not too long ago, uh, shot me an email and said, what do you think about all this Gestalt language processing stuff? And I didn't know the ulterior motive underneath the question, as you well, just you as you just exactly explained. Yeah. Um, and and, uh, and I, I became gradually aware of that. Um, but I can't say... Um, I'm enough of an expert or even enough experienced and right up to date on, you know, high tech systems mm -hmm. where I could say, okay, I've had this experience with kids or I've observed enough kids where somebody's taking a more of a gestalt approach versus an analytic approach yeah. and how kids are responding. But what you said is totally consistent with my philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that is if we don't have you know, a robust research literature. And I, I, you know, I'm even very skeptical of that because still every child is different. So <laughs> you, know, you, can't, you can't say we've done this study with 30 kids who we thought were gestalt language processors, but non-speakers. <laughs> and therefore our findings pertain to every new kid who walks through the door. Right. Um, so it, it's, you know, what you're saying aligns beautifully with, with, with my philosophy is, you know, when we're trying something that's an emerging practice, and if we want to put that there, I mean, this mm -hmm. is something that's so misunderstood, especially in the autism literature, where people say, well, you know, that's not evidence-based. We don't have this research base to support using that. Well, that would preclude any emerging or promising practices. Um, and, they're at the, and I'm not making up those terms. Mm -hmm. You know, they're actually, and, and it was a behavior analyst who said, a number of years ago, Richard Simpson, he published an article a number of years ago saying he, he was increasingly upset about behavior analysts relying solely on peer-reviewed public research to say we will do that or we won't do that at all. Mm -hmm. There has to be a cost-benefit ratio mm -hmm. that 
if there's not a robust research literature, why not try it if there's not a downside to it and see how kids react to it? Yes. And and we could go on and on. You know, I'm not going to get into the weeds of everything I'm going to say now. But for the longest time, people thought social stories, not evidence-based, don't do it. <laughs> and gradually an evidence-based developed for that. Mm-hmm. We can go back to AAC, early days of AAC. Mm-hmm. No evidence base for that. We could take it up now to the Gestalt, using Gestalt processing strategies in AAC. Um, we have to look, is there really a downside? And not only that, but I published an article on this a few years ago. Evidence, the the, the source of evidence is not just peer-reviewed published research. Mm-hmm. It's it's clinic, it, it's family values, it's client values, it's clinical experience and expertise. Even if you're not an SLP, it's the expertise of other professions, OT, um, special educators, and so forth, as a team feeding into documenting what seems to work and not. And then there are different opinions about how you even define it works or it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, so true. something you hit on there has been a, a staple of our podcast and something we've been trying to trumpet is um, here we are recording this in 2023. We have so many more autistic individuals that can tell us what worked and what didn't work. So let's listen to them. <laughs> Is that fair? 100%. Abs- absolutely. I mean, it, it's, and, and the thing that drives me crazy, and I've written, I've published on this, I've written on this, is if you look at ASHA definitions of evidence-based practice, if you look at American Psychological Association um, definitions of evidence-based pr- practice, it includes that triad of research, clinical practice, family, client values, and feedback. Yet we tend to ignore that. Mm-hmm. And I, I hate to say it, but sometimes um, the Facebook page on SLPs and evidence-based practice goes down that avenue. Well, I want to know the research evidence. We shouldn't be doing it if there's no research yeah, and it's it's like go back to the definition of evidence based <laughs> practice of the professional organization, please. <laughs> That's funny that you mentioned that triangle because Chris and I do a lot of presenting, and when we present, it's usually what we lead with, and we're really highlighting the 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 client perspective because we think that's the most kind of underutilized. Um, but it's funny you brought that up because, you know, we, we ask the question, like, what is evidence-based practice? And everyone says research, everyone says, everyone focuses on the science, right? Um, but it's a triangle. It's a triad. You know, one of the things that I think we've lost, um, and now I could play my elder statesman role here, (laughs) uh, in not only in my training, but in, in my deep knowledge at the time of the emerging research in the 80s and 90s, especially the so-called social pragmatic revolution, what was emphasized over and over by the leaders, you know, Elizabeth Bates, Catherine Nelson, Roger Brown, the leaders that established this rich research base in language development, okay, typical language development. What was the emphasis? Individual differences in development. And yet we still go back to that easy position of well, you know, this research with so many kids says we should do this with all kids, as opposed to looking very, very carefully at individual differences. I mean, there was an article, I think the guy's name is Jason Travers, who's done some stuff in behavioral psychology, which I really don't like too much. <laughs> but he actually published an article that he, he was arguing there's no such thing as different learning styles. All people learn the same. And it's based upon a behaviorist view of how people learn. And it's kind of like, okay, so go ahead and just ignore, you know, going back, you know, even to Howard Gardner's work on multiple intelligences, just ignore decades of research on individual differences in how people learn. How could you do that? (laughs) You know, Um, and some people in the field, unfortunately, they make their arguments on a very myopic view of the research they chose to focus, they choose to focus on. Mm -hmm. And they don't go back to the rich history of research in child and human development and how every person's different. And that's exactly, and I know you want to talk about this, it's exactly what neurodiversity is about. 
Right? Yes. I was just going to ask you this. So do you mind if I ask this question in a certain way? Because it's something that plagues me and I have two imps on my shoulder whispering different things. So <laughs> if, if you clarify this for me, maybe it clarifies this for lots of people. Go for it. Um, so the term neurodivergence or, or neurodiversity versus the term um, neurodivergent as an or a, a, a as an adjective to describe one person. So for instance, right. you just described how everybody's different, right? So in that way, everybody's neurodivergent from one another. It's describing a human condition that everybody's neurology is slightly different and you can't necessarily uh, pinpoint somebody into a category. Um, or is it, uh, this is the other imp on the other shoulder, no, there's two categories, neurotypical and neurodivergent, and you are one or the other. <laughs> In the yeah. same way, are you a gestalt language processor <laughs> or are you? Right? Um, so again, what's your take on that? Is it that there's two types of people, neurotypical and neurodivergent, or neurodivergency represents a human condition of all of us? Well, yeah, I mean, we're, again, once again, we're talking about a continuum actually for both terms. But I think when we talk about um, neurotypical we go back to the bell curve um and and you know what seems to be the majority position for most people um and neurodivergent you know would be the far ends of the bell curve because people emphasize too much a condition that's disabling okay mm -hmm. but neurodivergent could also be a person who has savant skills right mm -hmm. if there are and now then again, we just can't talk about intelligence as one thing. Right. Because a person can be, well, this may not be the best analogy. I've never used this before, but let me throw it out there, okay? Um, I have a number of friends and colleagues um, who prior to uh, Asperger's being thrown out of the autism spectrum that got diagnosis of Asperger's, okay? Mm -hmm. Their language abilities... I'm not talking about social communication. I'm talking about their language abilities are neurotypical in a lot of ways, okay? But they're neurodivergent in terms of risk factors for anxiety. So they tend to be more anxious and sometimes have, you know, a secondary diagnosis of anxiety disorder mm -hmm. on top of what's going on. So, so my point is that, right, neurodiversity covers kind of the full range all humans have different brains so we have different patterns of strengths and weaknesses and some of those weaknesses are disabling okay um neurotypical would be okay you fall within you know whatever it might be the 80 90 percent of that bell curve and that bell curve you're speaking it would be consistent with uh, different abilities. Like, so there's a bell curve for language. There's a bell curve for social emotional regulation. So there's not necessarily one bell curve. It's multiple bell curves for each ability or each skill set. Or is that fair? Yes, exactly. As a matter of fact, I do a workshop on neurodiversity, and I have the bell curve, and I under an asterisks about seven, eight different areas that you need to consider what that bell curve applies to, okay? Mm -hmm. So again, individuals on the spectrum who have an exceptional rote memory, or let's take another example, calendar calculators, mm -hmm. okay? So, I mean, they could tell you, you know, if you give them a date in the future, what date it falls on, you know, September 19, the year 3000. Okay, well, that falls on a Tuesday, you know, it's like, that certainly would be neurodivergent. It's well beyond the bell curve abilities or the, the, the majority of what the bell curve ability would be for most people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's emphasized enough, yet it's spoken about when we talk about, for example, employment for people who are neurodivergent. Let's look at the areas that they may show relatively and not even relatively absolutely strong abilities or exceptional abilities and let's have them participate in employment settings so they can apply that strength okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so i i use the term neurodivergent when a person is kind of beyond what we would expect in the general population 
the majority of what that bell curve tells us. Mm -hmm. Yet, having said all of that, we're still working out these definitions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you and and you're correct when you said that you know neurodiverse really shouldn't be applied to a single person or diversity is a larger group of people. Um, yet people I still see, and in some cases, people I know who've published, you know, in peer-reviewed research saying, oh, that person is neurodiverse, meaning that they have some condition which we would call neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. So, yeah.